So you're now going to tell me you've been waiting for me for 10 minutes, so you've been having some extra songs. <laughs> okay, that's, that's good to know. Yeah. So as I open God's word, let me uh, begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's a wonderful thing for us as we gather here this morning, your people, all one family together again. And we thank you, Father, so much that uh, in your mercy you have made it possible for us to be here. And Lord, also as we open your word, you made it possible for us to be able to read it and through the power of your Holy Spirit to understand it. And we pray that your spirit would speak to each of us today, that Lord, you would find us at our point of need and, and help us to grow in our faith and our trust in these troubled times. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a couple of months ago, as I was talking to uh, Steve, in fact, it was the day that I came down to do the uh, video of the interview um, that you have um, seen, perhaps, um, a couple of months back. And uh, Steve said, would you like to come back and preach? I said, well, actually, I'd love to. I'm not doing anything in particular apart from running a, um, a church in Jakarta um, online from Sydney. Um, that keeps me busy enough, but I knew that by this stage I would be free from that. And um, so I agreed to come. And I asked him, what would you like me to preach? And he said, well, actually, we're in between series, so you can, you can uh, preach whatever you like. All right, and I prayed about it, and I came up with um, 2 Peter chapter 3. And when I told him that that's what I was going to do uh, a few weeks ago, um, he laughed and he said, well, ironically, or, or part of God's design, we're actually starting a series on First Peter um, in the following week. And uh, so I said to him then that was part of God's plan. And, and actually, as we look at this passage, uh, I believe, this is armchair theology, okay? Um, I think I'm allowed to make statements like this. That I believe this passage in Second Peter chapter three belongs at the beginning of First Peter chapter one. This is the introduction. Um, so I'm giving you the end before the beginning. Um, that doesn't mean you don't come to church and listen to the sermons for the next three weeks. Um, I want you to do that. Um, actually, maybe I, that's a challenge. I should say, test what I say about this passage, uh, and in a month's time, um, let me know what you think. Was my prediction correct? I don't mind if I'm wrong. <laughs> but in the meantime, um, we can look at this passage um, as, in some ways, a step into um, the whole of both letters to Peter as this is the end of his second letter. Um, in the, uh, just to bring you up to date, I, I realised as I was coming down here that uh, we haven't sent out a newsletter for a, a little while. We're a bit overdue. Um, but um, since the beginning of September, um, I have been officially kind of not retired, but I'm back on the CMS um, uh, payroll um, because my contract at All Saints Jakarta has finished. So I'm no longer running the church there. Um, that's SEP, somebody else's problem. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, but in many ways, after six years of being very much engaged with the people there, um, it's come to an end. And uh, it's now a very, very remote thing. And it's interesting, the day that I was finishing up with All Saints, my old boss in Nigeria phoned me and said, uh, we want you to do a lecture online. And so the following week, the, the first thing I did in my new kind of uh, retirement, if that's what it is, um, was to do a, a Zoom lecture to um, the staff at, at the college where I used to teach in Nigeria, which is really exciting. And I think there's going to be more of that for me in the future. Um, in the meantime, we will finish with um, CMS probably about February or March next year. Um, and uh, I hope that we're going to be able to come back and have uh, a good visit with you for a couple of weeks um, before we, we finish. Um, we're now living on the Central Coast. And in the last um, week or so, Helen and I had a, a nice holiday at a place called Smith's Lake um, up, up near my old lake, so I don't know if you know it, but it's very easy for us to get to that part of the world these days. And while um, we were on that uh, little holiday, I decided I'd go and try stand-up paddleboarding. Hands up if you've done it, okay? Um, well, I don't know what you think of it, but I actually found it quite tame. Um, so. 
I don't know what I was expecting, especially on a flat lake that was as smooth as glass, you know. Um, but the first thing this guy told me is I'm sort of, uh, I'm on my knees and I'm still, we're sort of paddling out, getting to um, lesson one uh, on what to do, how to stand up and all of that. And I'm looking in the water and there's these massive, great big um, jellyfish floating along and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm not going to fall in. <laughs> no way am I going in that water. Uh, but then a stingray goes, you know, but it goes past and I'm thinking, oh no. And so he says, okay, try standing up. So I stood up. And, and then I was all bit wobbly like this. He says, it's okay. He says, now keep your eye on the horizon. Okay. So I did that. I looked up and immediately my, my legs stopped wobbling and, you know, I had the paddle in the water and everything and, and it was calm. It was okay because I wasn't looking down and looking at all the troubles in the waters that were possibly there. I was actually looking at the destination where I wanted to go. And I thought, that's an interesting thing. This is the second time I've heard this. Some years ago, I did something that was less tame. Uh, I went for a flying lesson. And I remember quite clearly the instructor saying to me, always keep your eye on the horizon. And there's for two reasons. If you sort of look out the, the windscreen of an aeroplane, all you can see is this blur of a propeller going around. Um, and if you're looking at that, you can't see much else. And the idea of looking at the horizon is you're actually looking through the blur and your focus actually looks further away and you're able to see quite clearly. Never mind the blur of the propeller, it's gone. The other thing is that you keep the, the right attitude so and, and, and altitude, hopefully, uh, but it's actually keeping the horizon at the right place that keeps you flying level. And um, this is what I think Peter is doing for us in this passage. He's saying to us, Watch the end. That's what we're going to. And this is why I believe this should be at the beginning of chapter 1 of 1 of, uh, Peter, of the first letter. This is the destination that we're going to reach. And for that reason, this is then how you should live as God's people in a very, very deeply troubled world. And he starts chapter 3 saying, this is my second letter that I've written to you. And I've written both of these letters to remind you, to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to be stirred in your minds about the things that you, you know and to live lives that reflect uh, wholesome thinking. The second thing he says, I want you to, to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. So there's two things. First, the prophets, and this is now written, spoken by the prophets, but now written, and that's all the scriptures they have. Well, some of Paul's letters may have been started to, to circulate at this stage, but essentially they had the words of the prophets that were written down, and Peter's saying, go back to that. That's your benchmark. As you look to the future, that's what you're standing on. That's your solid ground. And the teaching about Christ from himself and also from the apostles. Keep this in mind, and this is why I'm writing this letter, to bring you back to these basics, to make sure you're standing firm on them so you can go forward. But realise in verse 3 there's going to be scoffers, there's going to be distractions, there's going to be difficulties that are going to try and tug you away from this and draw you away. And we see in this, this world where we're, we're, we're bothered greatly by secular humanism and things like that, where the values that we have learnt in scriptures don't apply. In fact, they scoff at us, they revile us, they ridicule us, and they even make us outlaws because of what we believe in scripture. Christianity in many places has become anathema to people. You talk about biblical values um, and you'll get abused. You talk about what God says or what the Bible says and you're not very well liked. We know that. We've seen it in our own society, in our own communities. Um, it is rather common. And in the media, it is often uh, Christians who are reviled. But Peter reminds us it doesn't matter. Because remember this thing, that God created all things and he is going to complete all things with the destruction of the earth. And these scoffers will say in verse 4, where is this coming? 
Come on, clever clogs. You said you are going to come back, Jesus. Where are you? We've been waiting for you. And there's this reminder from Peter saying, ne never mind what they say. Just keep this in mind. God made the heavens and the earth. Um, in verse 4, ever since the fathers died, everything goes on as it has been since the beginning of creation. They forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, the earth was formed out of water and by water. God created. I love uh, the beginning of Genesis. It's, it's like this uh, manifesto to God's people saying, in the beginning, God. No explanation of who God is. Not needed because we all know who God is. Deep down inside of us we have this longing and desire to connect with God Almighty, the Creator. He made us like that because he wants to have fellowship with us. He wants us to be uh, in, a, in a relationship with him. And so that's why the writer in, in Genesis deliberately used those words, in the beginning, God. And then the rest of it, as we see the account of creation, how God did everything, never mind how he did it, whether it was by some big bang theory or, or some other thing like that. Uh, that. That's irrelevant. It's actually the fact that God did it. And that's how the, the, the New Testament starts and it almost, uh, sorry, uh, the Old Testament starts that way and the New Testament almost uh, in some way starts uh, in the same way with John bringing back that idea about the word. In the beginning was the word. And it is God who's going to bring it all to an end. These scoffers, they can, they can say all they like, but they don't have control over what's going to happen in the future. As we look at verse 10, uh, sorry, no, I'll just go back for a moment to talk about the, um, God's response to this. God's response to the, to the scoffers is, even though they're saying, where is this coming? Where is the Christ? Where, what's happened to him? And down through the ages, we've had people who've predicted that you know, the end of the world's going to happen on the 22nd of April, 1986. And so that date's passed by and nothing happened. And several other people have done that. And the fact is, we don't know when God is going to return. And then I remember in the early years of the Cold War, everyone was afraid that you know, someone was going to press the wrong button and blow the whole world by some nuclear holocaust or something like that. You know, it was either going to be Russia or America. We, most of us remember that. But no, we are not capable. We do not have the power to destroy this earth. We might have the technology, but we don't have the power and the authority. It is God alone who's going to destroy all things. That's what scripture tells us. So don't get worried about nuclear armament and all these kinds of things. That's irrelevant. Well, we could do a lot of damage with that, but we're not going to bring about the ultimate end of this earth as we know it. God alone is going to do that. And it's going to be with uh, incredible power, a, a demonstration, as he says in verse 10, about the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. A, a thing that we just can't imagine. I've even heard some people who've said that this coronavirus is the beginning of the end. It's a sign of the end times. Well, I don't know if that's true. I, I wouldn't um, say that myself, but, well, who, who can predict what's going to happen in a year's time? Who of us, a year ago, thought we would be sitting here wearing masks, for example, and all the other restrictions that we currently live under? We can't imagine what the future actually holds. But does that cause us to be afraid, fearful, uncertain, anxious? And for some of us, we've gone through all of those things uh, over these past six months or so. God is going to bring it at an end, but, but Peter reminds us that God is patient. In verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. The coming of Christ is not something that has been uh, delayed for a purpose. It's not God just being slack or anything like that. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is one of the most wonderful promises that we could find in Scripture. It is God's intention that no one should perish. 
It is God's intention that nobody should suffer calamity, that nobody should have any trouble in their life, that no one, no one without exception, should miss out on the opportunity of eternal life. God wants everyone to come to repentance. We need to understand that. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for every man, woman and child that ever lived and ever will live. Jesus' blood was shed that they may have an opportunity to come back to a relationship with God. Of course, if they choose not to, that's their problem. But God has made it possible for every one of us to enjoy this most wonderful relationship through what Christ has done. Everyone to come to repentance. And in a way, that makes my job as, as an evangelist more urgent. While God delays, while God is taking his time about coming back in his own perfect time, it's all the more reason for me to get out there and to continue to connect with people to bring them into an opportunity of salvation. If I don't, I'm neglecting my, my call. I'm, I'm neglecting what God has given for me to do. But it's all of us in our life that we are called to the same sort of witness, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the end is coming, and this is this expression, the day of the Lord, that's something that comes from the Old Testament, the idea of the end of the world. We see coronavirus... There's a recession, there's, there's uh, financial difficulties right across the world with, with, with uh, national and global economies and all these kinds of things. What on earth could happen next? We don't want to imagine it. But we don't look to the future, we don't look to the horizon with fear because we can see the horizon. We know what's at the end. We know that Christ will return. That's our great hope, our great joy, and that at the resurrection we too will be raised with him. That's our great hope. And I want to share that with more people. And I want each of us to have that attitude that we would live lives that would demonstrate this hope that we do have. And so quite rightly Peter says in verse 11, what kind of people ought you to be? Knowing that there's this coming destruction, knowing that this is the end that's upon us, what kind of people ought we to be? What sort of lives should we live? knowing that this is about to happen. Then he uses uh, this, this idea uh, of looking forward, and he mentions it three times in three verses. As you look forward, as you look forward. I think he's trying to give us a message. Did you get it? As you look forward, as you look at the horizon, this is the kind of lives I want you to have, to live holy and godly lives. And this is actually firstly an inward thing about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. As we allow ourselves to be transformed in our thinking by the Holy Spirit and, and, and allow God to change us, to make us more like Christ, we need to surrender more. We need to give more of our lives. Well, yes, we made that confession of faith in the beginning and said that we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Saviour. We did that. But it's an ongoing thing that day by day we give little bits of our life, the little sins that we do, little habits that are not right, the way we treat other people, our, treat our wives, our husbands, our children, these sorts of things, give it to God and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is the kind of people that we ought to be, that our lives are transformed. And as we look forward three times, this is not a passive thing. It's not like hey, we're looking back and looking at the horizon and saying, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll keep my eye on the horizon. Yeah, I'm just waiting for it to happen. No, no, it's, it's an active thing. That's why he mentions it three times. Look forward with action. Look forward with something happening in your life. And I'll skip down to verse 14 where we didn't read. Dear friends, since you are looking forward, there it is again, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Wow. There's a, an appeal for perfection. Can anyone be perfect? Well, we know the answer to that. No, not in this life. But there's nothing wrong with trying. This is what Peter is trying to say to us. When Christ does return, how is he going to find us? 
dabbling in sin, dabbling in all sorts of things that are inappropriate, lives that don't reflect his glory. And this is the outward part of looking to the horizon. That as we are looking to the horizon, we're calling others and saying, hey, look, see what I can see? Come and join with me and see Christ is coming. And when he does, if we are not followers of Christ, we are going to be partakers of this terrible, terrible destruction that is ours. Not that we're trying to start a guilt trip or scare people into heaven. Literally scare the hell out of them. You're apparently not allowed to talk about hell anymore. It's, it's too scary. Uh, I'll tell you what it is. It's a reality. Jesus knew that in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's why when he was praying, he was sweating great drops and he was agonising because he did not want to go there. He was only there for a matter of a few hours, but it was a terrible torment for him. He knew how bad it was going to be. Being out of God's presence, that's what hell is. And man, I don't want to do that for eternity. No thanks. I know where I want to go. I want to be with the Lord in heaven, not a godless eternity. That is what truly hell is about. So how does the world see each of us? The vast majority of world opinion is, is watching us and it's against us. And people are watching us. How do we react to COVID-19? Do we react with fear? Or with faith? Do we react with a hope or with despair? Before we return to the, to the, uh, the new normal, I'd like us to realise that we have a divine opportunity to show incredible Christian love and concern to the people around us. I think when all this uh, virus started that many of us were greatly affected. I know for me it was a terrible time. Uh, I was given 30 hours to get out of Jakarta and come home to Australia. No time to pack. I wasn't happy. I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay there with my people. And I believe that God called me to, to be their shepherd. And it was the last thing I wanted to do. But I had no choice. And so trying to minister to them, at least for the first month, I was so shattered and emotionally destroyed that I, I wasn't very capable at all. I tried as best as I could. But I'll be, I'll be honest with you, it was very, very difficult emotionally. And maybe even still, I'm dealing with some of that. It's very, very hard to have things like that happen. But I wasn't alone, because all of us in different ways have had calamity come at us. Maybe we've lost a loved one. Or maybe our business has gone belly up because of the virus. Or maybe we find ourselves working from home and not being very, very good at it. Lots of things have happened to us. And so, in some ways, maybe life will become difficult, more difficult for us. It's certainly our prayer that it doesn't, and we pray every day that God will bring this thing to an end. And, and never mind people who, are, who cry out and say, why did you allow this to happen, God? That, that's God's counsel. We will never know why this has happened. God alone can, can answer that question. But if we are a community of God's people who profess to love the people around us, during these difficult times, there are so many people who are hurting, who need help. And if we don't respond in some way as a church, as individuals, as God's people, um, we're, then we're not doing a very good job. We're not doing what Peter said about living holy and godly lives in verse 11 to help people in their need. And you know, it's easy and commendable to help our friends, to help our, our families, to help the people we like and the people who like us. Oh, that's very commendable. It's very easy to do because that's who they are. But to help strangers and to help people who actually would revile us even while we're giving them help, that's much more difficult. And what did Jesus do as he's hanging on the cross and he's about to to breathe his last breath. The man standing down there looking up at him and, and saying silly things at him. If you're the king of the Jews, 
get yourself down off the cross and just making absolute ridicule of what was going on. And Jesus looks at him and says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. What a wonderful thing to see, this love flowing out to Jesus towards these people who hated him, who even killed him. And he's calling us to the same kind of life as his disciples, that we would love those who even hate us and revile us. And when we do that, it's interesting, sometimes people provoke us, they try to, to, to get a, a rise out of us, to see if we react in the same way that, that unbelievers do. I've seen it happen many times. And when we don't react predictably, according to their criteria, uh, they're actually surprised. And it actually opens up an opportunity for us to share our faith. A wonderful opportunity to say, this is what moves me, this is what causes me to love you. It's the love of Christ. What did we learn from this coronavirus? Some people talk about the new normal when we return to it. I, I, I'm sure most of us have come to the conclusion that life will never be the same as it used to be. Uh, if we believe that, I, I think we've got a problem. We've got to look around us and see that we do things so differently now to what we did before. And life as it is will never be the same again. And we've got, to, we've got to adapt to it. We've got to find ways that we can make the most out of this as, as God's people, but also ways that are going to help us to grow emotionally and to deal with new and un, unbelievable and unimaginable circumstances, the, the likes of which we have lived through in the last six months or so. It would be an awful thing in a year or two to look back and say to ourselves, what did I learn from COVID? I learned nothing. I didn't grow. And that would be a great tragedy for anybody to have done that. If nothing else, I believe that this is actually an opportunity for us to grow in our faith. And as we keep our eyes on that horizon and keep our eyes fixed on Christ and the coming of his glory. It's a great time for us to be able to put our trust in him and to share our faith with others. Let me finish by reading verse 18 as Peter concludes his two letters to the churches. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen.